We're going back into the fruit of the Spirit, where it says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You guys heard the song. And, and what that fruit is, is it's, it's the Spirit growing God's character in you. Because that list, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faith, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, is like a pretty good description of what Jesus is like, right? And this week, we're going to focus in on this word, faith. And it's good that we, like you guys have heard, if you've been around a church, you've probably heard the fruit of the Spirit before. And there's something really great about that, that we're familiar with something that's so crucial to our faith, right? Like our kids are singing it, maybe you learn the fruit of the Spirit's not a coconut, whatever that is for you. Like, we've learned that if you've been around a church for a long period of time. But, but sometimes being around something for a long period of time can mean that we mislearn something, can mean that we actually learn something wrong. And so whenever we need to learn something new, it feels right that I put on a professorial suit jacket, and we're going to do some vocab and grammar class, right? I mean, who isn't excited for vocab and grammar class? And also some fun pronunciation. So kids, I'm going to need some help with pronunciation here, but um, can, can we get our first word on the screen? Peace. Can you guys say that with me now? Peace. In, in English, most of the time, the word peace just means like freedom from disturbance. That's how we normally use it, like we feel at peace. And there's like this secondary meaning of not at war, but we don't tend to talk about that all that much. Here's the issue. When we read the English peace in our Bibles, it's translated from the Greek, irene. Can we say that? Kids, you want to try that out? You're going to learn ancient Greek today. Irene. Got it? Let me hear it. That's, it just means relational harmony. Like every time that, that the word is translated peace in the Bible, it's this word, irene, except for the one time where Jesus is talking to the storm, that's a different word altogether. So don't factor that in when we're talking about it. But it's this word, irene, that means relational harmony. It means governments that are not at war. It means people that are getting along. And, and the issue is we normally, define it from, we normally define peace as like this freedom from disturbance or tranquility, but there's like already Greek words for that. Uh, actually, sorry, let's, let's go back to Irene. That, that for, for the New Testament writers, draws from a deeper and older Hebrew meaning of shalom. Can we say that? Shalom. And that means, like, harmony and thriving. That's not just this idea of we're getting along. It's also like the whole world is working like it should. When we talk about peace in Scripture, this is the peace that we're talking about. Like, relational harmony that leads to thriving, that leads to the whole world operating in the order, the good order that God made it to. And, and the issue is there's, there's already other Greek words that mean tranquility or not disturbed. Th this is one of them. Can we throw it on the board? That's fun. Anyone want to try a shot before I pronounce it? Uh, so it's me terasao or a uh, terasao. And, and, and what that means is just quite literally not troubled, serene, or calm. Like, there's already that word. That word exists, but that's not the word that, that, that Scripture normally uses when it says peace. And there's another word. It means, it, it says this. Anyone want to try this one? This one's real fun. Oh, yeah. Kids, yeah, anyone want to try that? Any of our best readers? It's pronounced me merim nao. Me just means not, right? Merim nao means anxious. And, and there are times when Jesus is like, hey, me terasao. Don't be troubled, or may merim not oh, don't be anxious. But when, when, when Scripture talks about making peace, it's not either of these words. It's this word that talks about relational harmony. And, and that's what we're going to get into today. So thank you for the vocab lesson and your pronunciation. You guys all get an A, I guess. Um, but we're going to go into Galatians. I figured since this is maybe a new topic for some of you. And that's fine. If, if you're finding yourself already disagreeing with me and searching Scripture for why I'm wrong, great. Let's sit with it for a second. And when we read this passage in Galatians, why don't you stick with it and see if, if there are any ways where it seems like peace is actually talking about relational harmony. Because this letter of Galatians is a letter written to a church that's already fighting. A letter written to a church that's not getting along whatsoever. And, and here's what Paul says in Galatians 5, 16 through 26. It says this, uh, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh, for those are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. 
patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And if we live in step with this, and if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. This is the word of the Lord. Were you, were you kind of catching where, where peace refers to getting along? To not fighting with one another? Like, and, and I want to be clear on the front end. Relational harmony is not the same as not having conflict, right? Because Paul is writing to a church that is having some troubles. Paul is writing to a church where there's racial unrest, where there's infighting, where there's theological disagreements. And for him to say we're not going to have any conflict means he doesn't write the letter. If you want to look at, like, difficult conflict, read the letter of Galatians and talk to me because Paul goes off. Like, Paul says some things that could very easily feel mean or rude, and yet he does this thing because in the interest of making peace, there must be conflict here. Like, it's important to note that there's a difference between, like, divisions and disagreement. That conflict is not the same as fighting. Like, if you've been in any community of people for more than, like, 90 minutes, you know that conflict comes up. Someone says something flippantly that you're actually sensitive to. Someone says something that you ardently disagree with, right? Someone says something that, that like, gets under your skin. Someone says something that they actually meant to hurt you, and you need to figure out what to do with that. If you've been a part of any community, especially a family, you know that conflict exists, or especially a church family, you know that conflict exists. And this is where the call to peace comes in. Because for us, in, in, in American English, a lot of times the word peace means serenity, And there's this big push, like, when there's an issue with someone else to protect my peace, we're just going to distance. We're just going to separate ourselves. And the issue is, Paul is clear, like, the people who do those things aren't going to inherit the kingdom of God. The reason is, when we're factious, when we're divisive, what community is left to be God's kingdom? Like, if everyone who upsets you, everyone who agrees differently than you, if you take every opportunity for a person who slights you to be cut off from you, Like, legitimately, at some point, who's left? I don't know if you've ever felt that. Like, you've been like, you've looked around, you're like, where are all my friends? And and then you think back over the years, you're like, oh, I cut them off for things. There is this, like, big push to protect ourselves, but but the issue is that the work of lasting relationships, lasting friendships, is the work of peace. And and, and that's where he says the fruit of the Spirit is the opposite of the works of the flesh, right? And, And if you notice, the works of the flesh did not say, if we can throw the list of the works of the flesh on the screen, it did not say, uh, uh, can you jump ahead to the, oh, it's great. It, It did not say, like, being troubled in your spirit. It didn't say that the works of the flesh are dreading the future. It didn't say that the works of the flesh is anxiety, And we talked a handful of weeks ago that the works of the flesh are not just like these things that you do that you're human. They're these things that happen because even though God made you good, we twist things. Things have become twisted. And we do things that hurt us and hurt others instead of what God intends for us, which is living in relational harmony. Like when you look at that highlighted list, don't you know the feeling of those words? Enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy. Like, don't you know the feeling of that list? Is it a good feeling? When we live in peace, those are the things that we are set against. When we grow grow the fruit of peace, those are the things that we're set against. And if there was any question as to whether or not Paul was talking about peace as relational harmony as opposed to, like, internal tranquility, look at where he closes the little bit. Next line, it says this. It says, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. He doesn't say, grow peace, let us become more tranquil, more calm, more meditative. He says, grow peace, stop fighting with each other. Like he writes to a church that is constantly fighting against each other. He's like, stop it. That's not who we are. The people who act that way are not a part of God's kingdom. And then he says that the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And these aren't different fruits. These are all the same things kind of being described in a lot of ways. Like, they work together, and it, and it embodies the character of Jesus, doesn't it? Like, if you took out the fruit of the Spirit, and you wrote the word Jesus, Jesus is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness. Go on, go back, please. Patience, kindness, goodness, 
faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Doesn't that feel like a pretty good list of what Jesus is like? That's what the fruit of the Spirit is. It's, it's the Spirit growing God's character in you. And the fruit of the Spirit is not the, the opposite of, like, anxiety. Yeah, that's a good thing. It's just not this thing. It, it's, it's not not being troubled. It is good to not be troubled. It's just not this thing. It's not the opposite of, of not being calm. Like, it's good to be calm. It's just not this thing. It's the opposite of factiousness and envy and dissension and fits of rage. It's the opposite of enmity and strife. It's the opposite of division, which if that doesn't feel like a shot at the way that Christian churches call division denominations and we're cool with it, then I don't know what does. Paul looks at these things and says, those are the works of the flesh. And we are called to a higher standard of acting different of growing the fruit of the Spirit in us, and it's not avoidance of conflict. Again, if if relational harmony was based on avoidance of conflict, Paul would have never written Galatians in the first place. Because how often is avoiding conflict the thing that actually makes the conflict grow deeper? How often is not saying anything the thing that actually makes the issue get bigger? Yeah, it's true that there are some issues that, like, if you sleep, it's not an issue anymore. There are some issues that are like pre-dinner issues that after you eat dinner, you're like, what was I mad about? I don't remember it. That's fine. It's okay to wait on things. But there are some things that like we wait on and we try and keep our inner peace and our inner calm at the expense of actually making harmony with other people. And the issue is that this peace that we're talking about, this peace of the fruit of the Spirit that's growing God's character in you is based first and foremost on the person of Jesus, Right? This character is based first and foremost on the person of Jesus. And in Romans 5.1, we read this. It says that it is through Jesus that we have peace with God through the cross. This is the foundation of what we think of when we say peace. It is God taking warring parties and making them one family together. It is turning enmity into friends. Right? It, is, it is a creator and a creation that has rebelled against us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. When we read the word, word peace, it bases itself on this, on Christ's willingness to die so that we could again be heirs instead of enemies. Amen? That's what we found ourselves on. Like when we talk about peace, except for the time that Jesus talks to a storm, it is all about this peace. The kind of peace that turns warring factions into a family. And and sometimes this type of peace can actually grow the other type of peace. That that type of American internal peace. I I only say, like, that, that sense of calm. Jesus actually talks about this when he's going away. And he's saying he's going to send the Spirit to be with us. Does anyone remember this passage? He says, peace I leave with you. Peace I give to you. That's not calm. That's not serenity. If if those were the words, he would have used those Greek words. Being serene and being calm are good things. It's just not this thing. Because if you actually read that verse, he then goes on to say, "And and let your hearts not be troubled. No, go back, please. It says, and let your hearts not be troubled. They're they're different things. And, and, And being at relational harmony with one another can lead to calm. But sometimes it's trying to keep the peace that stops us from actually making peace, isn't it? Sometimes it's trying to feel calm in ourselves that actually keeps us from addressing a real issue that exists. When we talk about the peace that happens in Scripture, it is not about feeling serene because it draws from the character of Jesus. And is Jesus better defined as the serene one or the peacemaking one? When we talk about peace, what this word means, it it, it mirrors the same thing when Jesus is giving the Beatitudes and he says, blessed are the peacemakers. That's what we're talking about. We're talking about people who make peace because when we look at Jesus, like how calm was he when he flipped tables? How walking on eggshells was he when he addressed the many husbands to the woman at the well so that they could have deeper relationship? Like how serene... Was he when he called people a brood of vipers or an unwashed cup, which is like a really weird insult that's never going to get you anywhere today. But like, these are not the embodiments of just being calm and peaceful all the time. It's a willingness to start conflict towards making harmony. 
And sometimes we are so comforted by the fact that God's going to make everything better that we don't actually do the work of making things better. Sometimes we can feel so serene knowing that someday God's going to remake the whole world that we never worry about actually caring for the world that we live in. Sometimes we can feel so hopeful that tomorrow's going to be a better day that we never put in the work to actually make tomorrow the better day that we want. Sometimes we can feel so secure in the fact that God has forgiven us that we never do the hard work of actually forgiving other people. And the issue is when we do that, we are not growing peace. And, and when we do that last thing, we actually run the risk of on the final day calling out to Jesus and saying, Lord, Lord, and him saying those heart-wrenching words of, depart from me, I never knew you. Like, where were you when I was trying to bring peace? You were nowhere to be found. When the, fruit, when the Spirit grows the fruit of peace in us, walls fall. Divisiveness itself breaks down. And sometimes it's trying to keep the peace of keeping undisturbed that actually keeps the divisions alive, right? Sometimes, very often, it is our feelingness of being unsettled that makes us do the work of doing something to make it better, right? Like, where would the American Civil Rights Movement been if everyone felt serene and calm with the way that things were? How often throughout history have good things been kept from being done because people were trying to keep the peace, People were trying to keep people from being riled up over a thing that should rile you. Like when we talk about this fruit of peace, sometimes it involves conflict to make it. Sometimes it involves feeling uncalm in order to, to be active enough to do something about it. And, and I had this conversation with my mom this week. You guys met her earlier. She's a pro at Ninja Bear Wizard. But for those of you who don't know, my mom and I are very different people. I'm loud. I'm brash. I'm fine to be the center of attention. My mom, I think, has left the room so that she doesn't... Oh, there she is. She's currently embarrassed for the fact that I'm talking about this. But that's, that's not her. And she asked me this question that shifted my thinking a little bit on this this week. She was like, Dan, that's all fine and well for you because you like being that person. That's not me. How do I make peace? And it, and it got me thinking about all the different ways that we can make peace that aren't necessarily flipping someone's table to stand up for other people. Like, there are as many ways to make peace as there are people in this room, or as there are habits that you've grown throughout your life that you can use to build relationships where, where you need bridges and barriers exist. Like, if we get back to that, like, there's this thing that happens with pastors that a lot of us are, like, gregarious, like me, and outgoing. And you can get the feeling like, I just need to be more extroverted in order to be more Christian. And that's not the case. A lot, a lot of pastors are like pretty meditative. And it feels like you just need to be more meditative in order to be more Christian. And maybe that's the case, but, but not always. A lot of times Christian, like, Christian pastors are like very well studied and studious and kind of bookish. And you can get the feeling being in the congregation that you need to read more in order to be a better Christian. Let's be clear, lots of people could never read and were still Christians. You don't need to be more like me in order to make more peace. Like, you can find ways to make peace that I would never, ever think of doing. And it got me thinking, like, what are all the different ways that we make peace that aren't anywhere near what I would do? And it's like, peace grows when we learn the habit of, like, listening first to understand. Peace grows when we empathetically seek to understand the other person instead of thinking that I have all the answers. Peace grows when two people sit down to coffee, when it seems like they would have nothing in common and they, and they find something in common together. Peace grows when you cook meals for people and treat them like family. Peace grows when you encourage someone to talk to their spouse. Peace grows when like, you are willing to ask for an apology when you've been hurt. Peace grows when you're humble enough to actually apologize when you've hurt someone. Peace grows when you're willing to have hard conversations, but you're also willing to drop that hard conversation when a deeper hurt unearths itself and you're like, this thing that we're arguing about doesn't matter anymore. You matter more than the thing. That's when peace grows. And certainly there are relationships that are worth cutting off. Like... Peace doesn't necessarily grow when you just remain calm and quiet and enabling someone else to continue to harm you. Peace doesn't grow when we just cover up the hurt with years and years of trying to forget about it 
and we just end up growing that kind of gnawing pit in ourselves. Those are not ways that peace grows. Peace grows when you start to take a shot at actually dealing with something. Even when it doesn't work out, peace grows when the other person realizes that we're not good together. You hurt me and we need to sort this out. Peace even grows when you cut someone off actively instead of just passively ghosting them and never talking about it. Peace grows sometimes when you stand up and you exit a relationship where you keep being harmed and you say, this isn't going to happen anymore. Yeah, that will grow your own calm and your own tranquility, but it also grows peace. And the hard thing about this as American Christians is we are real out of practice of this, aren't we? Like we, amongst all people, are real out of practice at actually building bridges because we're so used to feeling like we need to defend ourselves against the people who are trying to attack us. We're so used to feeling like we need to attack the people who believe differently than us so that we can make sure that everyone believes what we believe. That we, we are untrained at the muscle of living in the tension of growing peace, and it is not in any means straightforward. Like, if, if you're struggling with an issue with, like, a rebellious son, if you're struggling with an issue with, like, a cousin who has said things to hurt you, if you're struggling with an issue with a family member who has done things in your past that you haven't gotten over, if you're struggling with, like, a workmate who has harmed you, if you're struggling with just, like, living in the U.S. in an election year and realizing how divisive it is, Galatians isn't going to give you every answer that you need to start growing peace in there. And that's why it's so great that the Spirit is the one who grows peace in you. Because that spirit of peace is also a spirit of wisdom. The issues that, that, that face our relationships are so complex that easy answers don't really work anymore, do they? It takes wisdom to sort out, is this a thing that I need to have conflict over? Is this a thing that I need to pass? Have I had too many conflicts and I need to not take this fight so that I can take the next one? Like, have you guys felt this before? It takes wisdom to sort out harmony. It takes wisdom to live together, and wisdom doesn't necessarily mean I pray and God tells me exactly what to do. Wisdom also means that I pray and God gives me the ability to enter into the difficulty and sort it out. It is so wonderful that we have a God who not only brings peace, but brings wisdom for us to sort it out. And sometimes that's going to grow towards tranquility. Sometimes that's going to actually flare something up so that you can deal with it. Sometimes it's going to unearth an old hurt that the other third person thought that you were over, but you're not over, and discussing it is a way to get past it. Sometimes it means you need to say something to someone and be like, hey, the way you've been treating me for years is not okay, and I don't like it. Like, whatever that looks like, I don't have all the answers for you. Galatians doesn't even have all the answers to, for you. But when we meet with the Spirit, the Spirit has the wisdom for us to sort these things out. And when we enter into these difficult circumstances of making peace, I have to think that the other parts of the fruit of the Spirit will help. Like when we enter into conflict in love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, we run a pretty good chance of making peace also. Unless we think that this is just something that we can talk about here and then move on from today, it is a communion Sunday. And there's this passage in scripture in Matthew 5 where it says, if you're offering your gifts on the altar and you realize that a brother has something against you or you have something against your brother, leave your gifts on the altar and go make things right. We don't put gifts on an altar. We do take communion together because this table is the table of peace. The table of a Jesus who made peace between us and God when we had no right to do it and we can't be people who keep coming back to Jesus' peace and thinking we're good with God when we're not good with others. And so he, here's what I'm going to say. If you have been spending this time, and I've been talking about peace, and a relationship keeps popping up to you that you need to grow peace on, in, if there has been a deep bitterness that you've been harboring for years and you've never addressed, if there's a thing where you need to apologize to someone and you've been too proud to apologize, then leave your gifts on the altar. There's no shame in this. There's no shame in needing to wait to come to God because I need to sort something out. This table's going to be here all day. This table's going to be here, and then when we lock up the church, this table is going to be outside the doors of the church that if you want to swing by later after you've reached out to someone, you are welcome to. But if we're going to take seriously the fact that the Spirit grows peace in us, then we need to take seriously the fact that we are called to grow peace in our world. And so if you need to kind of remain in prayer where you are because you have something that you need to deal with, that's fine. That is a faithful step. If you want to send a quick text now to open up a conversation that you're going to deal with later, that's fine. Come up and take communion. But I want to encourage us. 
that if you're getting ready to take communion, if you're getting ready to receive the peace and welcome of God, and you're still maintaining enmity or strife or factiousness with a brother or sister or friend, then we need to be people who take growing peace seriously. Leave your gifts on the altar. They'll be here. Come back to it later and take the time to deal with the issues that we have. As David comes up, let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would give us wisdom this week in sorting out some of the things that we need to sort out. Lord, I pray that you would give us love as we talk to people. Lord, that you would give us joy as we appreciate the things that they are. Lord, that you would give us patience. Lord, I pray that you would be the one who grows the fruit of the Spirit in us, that we can more and more look like you in this world. And Lord, as we come forward to take your peace, to appreciate the fact that we are at the table with you. Let that spark something in us, that we can forgive others as you have forgiven us. In your name we pray. Amen.